Welcome back to Soviet Space Program. We will begin 1960 by reviewing the program standings. Crewed orbit is about halfway through the duration, with little to show for progress. Facility upgrades have occupied the first phase, but the next steps will be cosmonaut training and uncrewed test flights. Early Earth observation satellites is nearing the midway point with half of the objectives completed. This is on track with no real concerns. Early commercial applications has been used to subsidize the other programs and currently has zero progress. That will be changing this year as there are several flights lined up. Early interplanar probes is also just beginning, but the aim will be to hit an upcoming Venus transfer window roughly one year from now. The first launch of the year is a dual objective mission, ride sharing two separate payloads. The Cosmos 1 is carrying the first communication satellite, as well as the first navigation satellite. Although both contracts have different orbital parameters, it is possible to pick an orbit that will check off both mission requirements. Just like previous missions, a final kick will be performed at Apogee to place the payloads in the correct orbit. At Apogee, the Ullage motors fire, followed by a successful ignition of the U-2000 stage. The payloads are placed into a final 2100 by 2800 kilometer orbit at 50 degrees inclination. With these first communications and navigation satellites handed over to the customer, repeatable contracts are now unlocked and can be taken to increase confidence. 12th of March is a magnetometry satellite under the Early Earth Observation Satellites program. This mission is being launched at dusk to better align the solar cells on the probe with the sun. This experiment has a higher power requirement compared to the previous cosmic ray mission, making the probe slightly larger with an increased surface area for solar cell coverage. Final insertion places this at a 183,000 by 10,000 km orbit. This will operate in the background for several months before the contract can complete. Basic capsules will be unlocking in 71 days, so it is about time to modify the R7 launch complex to support the Vostok upgrade. With the new hardware and extended RD-0105 stage, the Vostok sits at 287 tons and over 35 meters tall, exceeding the current LC limit. Another important factor is that this will require the launch complex to also be human rated. This upgrade will be set to a height increase of 36 meters and a max tonnage of 300 to allow for a bit of future growth. The launch complex upgrade will take longer than basic capsules unlock. So the construction rate is increased to 110%, so they both finish together on May 24th. By March 22nd, the Cosmonaut Complex upgrade finally completes, meaning it is time to get the proficiency training going for Alexander and Yana. The training time is 228 days, so there is an opportunity to get a crewed flight in before the end of the year. Now that funding isn't allocated to facility upgrades, 30 researchers are hired, then auto-hire is set to 900 as time is passed to the next launch. 30th of April is an optional commercial satellite contract, requiring 120 units of ComSat payload, with a payout from the contract of 242 confidence. Thankfully, these contracts have flexibility in the final orbit, allowing for the use of unguided stages. Near-Earth avionics at this current tech level can end up being quite large and heavy. So if a contract doesn't require high precision, this method will be used where possible. The U-2000 fires up and places the commercial satellite into a 9400 by 3400 kilometer orbit, meeting the customer's requirements. With the extra researchers, Basic Capsules is now unlocking a few days earlier than the LC upgrade. Construction could be rushed to match that date, but it would drain the bank and not have the funds to build a Vostok. Instead, construction is throttled to 105% and we warp to the completion of the LC. 
It is time now to get the first Vostok onto the production line. With tooling purchased and 436 engineers shifted back to the LC, the integration time is a slow 150 days. Due to the human rating, a lot more engineers will be needed to get comparable build times to the rockets which only carry probes. The first Vostok will be integrated with a shortage of staff, as at the current moment it is more important to expedite research to try to hit the first Venus transfer window. Auto hire is set to 1000 researchers, and time is warped to the next launch. 22nd of June is a launch for an early navigation network under the Early Commercial Applications Program. This specific network will be made up of three satellites, which luckily all fit on the same rocket. The contract doesn't require these satellites to have a specific phasing between each other, so this launch method is perfectly acceptable. The Cosmos 1 completes orbital insertion, placing it into a 200 by 770 kilometer transfer orbit. However, this time the payload does not yet decouple from the upper stage. This will need to complete several orbits until a ground station is connected for the final kick to be performed. After several orbits, a connection is re-established. The upper stage uses RCS to perform the ullage and spin stabilization. Then, the U-2000 ignites and places the satellites into their final orbit. A quick two-minute shakedown test is performed before being handed over to the client. Time is ticking for the Mars and Venus transfer windows, so it is time to plan what days could be achievable. The first Venus window shows to occur January 16th of 1961. Deep Space Avionics will be unlocked in December, so this is a possible launch window. For Mars, it has its first transfer window opening in September, but there is no way that will be able to happen given the current tech. A later Mars window is found in October of 1962, so unfortunately, Mars will have to wait two years before getting a chance to launch a mission. In the event that the January 61 Venus window does not work out, the next Venus window opens again in 1962. By July, Digital Communications is unlocked, allowing the start of the Level 3 Tracking Station upgrade. This will complete in about two months, and it will also unlock the capability for vehicles to act as relays. That will become important later, once the agency begins to land probes on the Moon and other planets. September 23rd, the first test flight of the Vostok program lifts off. Before sending humans to space, the hardware needs to be tested and verified to confirm the proper operation of the life support and other critical systems. On booster separation, the Korolev cross is not so Korolev, and one of the separation motors experiences an issue. Thankfully, this does not compromise the mission. The core carries on, and then the fairings separate, exposing the Vostok command module for the first time. Then, a minute later, the RDO-105 ignites, propelling the Vostok module for the remaining five minutes of the orbital insertion. At the moment, orbital rocketry research is lagging behind, meaning that this flight is operating on the 1958 configs for the RD-107, 108, and RDO-105. The race for Venus has placed the focus on avionics and communications, putting improved engines and reliability on the back burner. Regardless of the engine tech level, orbital insertion is a success, placing Karabul Sputnik into a 170 km orbit. For the next three hours, environmental conditions and systems will be monitored by mission control. With system checks complete, the deorbiting sequence is initiated, achieving a predicted landing zone somewhere in Asia. The Vostok capsule speeds through the atmosphere, reaching forces of almost 10 Gs. A 
minute later, the capsule slows down and enters a free fall. The parachutes deploy and safely bring the capsule down somewhere in Pakistan. The success of the uncrewed test flight means the first cosmonaut can now be sent into space. But given the importance of the Venus transfer window, that will have to wait. With interplanetary communications unlocked, tracking station level 4 upgrade now takes place. The upgrade will complete three days after the Venus window, so it will be just in time for the mission to succeed. With technology and communications lined up for the Venus window, it is time to prepare Venera 1. There is two and a half months remaining before Deep Space Avionics is unlocked, so an interim Venera probe with a dummy avionics unit will be integrated in the meantime. Waiting until December for Deep Space Avionics is not an option, as the rocket will not be ready in time, so this tactic needs to be used. Fast forwarding to November, Yana and Alexander complete their Vostok proficiency training, which also extends their retirement by 257 days. They will have to also perform a specific mission training when it comes time for their flights, so that will be started later when the crewed Vostok rocket is built. December 2nd, Deep Space Avionics is now unlocked, so into the VAB to modify the Venera rocket. Unfortunately, even though it's a small change, the Kerbal Construction Timer mod thinks that 74% has been edited, requiring almost 24 days to modify. It will cost more than anticipated, but what can you do? This brings us to the close of 1960. There was an opportunity to get the first cosmonaut to space this year, but priority was chosen for Venera instead. Let me know in the comments what you think about this decision, and whether you think we can still beat the real-life milestone of Yuri Gagarin. Thanks for watching, and see you on the next episode.